possibility, even if a trustworthy person informs him of it, he says, was our lack of hearing the sounds that go on through the world evidence that those sounds did not exist until the radio was invented and gave us the ability to hear and confirm, confirm those sounds? He said, the truth of the matter is that the correct position is that the jinn are a third type of being, apart from the angels or the human beings. They are intelligent creatures and are not matter, not microbes, not organisms, not bacteria, they're not germs, or any of these other things. They are responsible for their actions and have been ordered by Allah to perform some deeds and to abstain from others. <clears throat> then he brings some evidences that Ibn Taymiyyah has brought in his book Majmur Fatawa. He quotes Ibn Taymiyyah, None of the different groups of Muslims have differed about the existence of the jinn, nor in the fact that Allah sent Muhammad as a messenger to them also. The majority of the different groups of the disbelievers also confirm their existence. And the people of the book from among the Jews and the Christians also accept their existence in the same way as the Muslims. Even though one may find some among them who will deny their existence. But in the same way, some can find among the Muslims some who deny their existence. He said, like the Jahimiyyah and the Mu'tazila. But the majority of the sects, still Ibn Taymiyyah making this statement, but the majority of the sects and their leading scholars accept their existence. This is because the reports about their existence have come and mutawatir reports from the prophets, from the prophets of old. Mutawatir meaning in numerous narrations, numerous, numerous uh, narrators. They have come from the prophets of old, with, uh, which necessitates his confirmation. He says, It is also known with certainty that they are alive, thinking, and acting by choice. They have been ordered to do certain deeds and have been prohibited from certain other deeds. They are not attributes or characteristics of humans or other creatures, as some of the atheists claim. Since the matter of the jinn is something narrated in mutawatir form, in forms that have, in other words, narrations that have numerous uh, narrators, from the prophets, the scholars and the masses know about them, and no group that claims any relationship with a messenger may deny them. End quote. Then, on page 13 of the same treatise, he says, All of the groups of the Muslims acknowledge the existence of the jinn, as do the majority of the people of the book, meaning the Jews and the Christians. The polytheists among the Arabs and others from the children of Ham, the son of Nuh, Similarly, he says, the majority of the Canaanites and the Greeks from a group of people believe in them. The majority of all people accept their existence. He says, as for the proof from Quran and Hadith, we have the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah appropriately called the Jinn. قُلْ أُوحِيَ إِلَيَّ أَنَّهُ اسْتَمَعَ نَفْرٌ مِّنَ الْجِنْ Say, O Muhammad, it is revealed unto me a company of the jinn gave ear. And also, in the English translation of that surah, verse 6, surah jinn, and indeed, O Muhammad, individuals of mankind used to invoke the protection of individuals of the jinn, so they increased them in revolt. He says, in fact, there exist many statements about them in Quran and Hadith, and then, he said that we'll mention some, and we won't mention them here for the sake of time, inshallah. Because there are quite a few. Then the sheikh says that the donkeys and the dogs see the jinn. He said, even though we humans do not see the jinn, some of the animals, like dogs and donkeys, can see them. He says it is recorded in the Musnad of Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal and the Sunan of Abi Dawood with an authentic chain from Jabir radiallahu anhu that he, the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said and this is the hadith that we, we narrated, we quoted the earlier when we talked about the angels the English translation is if you hear the barking of a dog or the braying of a donkey during the night seek refuge with Allah from the shaitan 
as they see what you do not see. And the Sheikh al Ashkar says, this shouldn't be strange to us, because many scientists have confirmed that animals are capable of many things, like seeing uh, things that human beings can't see. Like, for instance, bees. Scientists have proven that bees can see ultraviolet light. And, and they also can see the sun on an overcast day. And he also says that an owl, an owl, can see a mouse running in a crowded corn patch in pitch black night. So how much more should we believe if we believe that? And how much more should we believe that these, these animals can see these jinns? As for the shaitan and the jinn, the sheikh says, the shaitan, which Allah mentions many times in the Quran, is from the world of the jinn. He used to worship Allah at the beginning of his creation, and he lived among the angels in the heavens, and he entered paradise, then he disobeyed Allah, and refused to prostrate to Adam out of pride and arrogance and jealousy. Therefore Allah threw him out of his mercy. Shaitan, in the Arabic language, means كل عات متمرد every arrogant rebel it's a general term for any arrogant rebellious individual the linguistic meaning and it's used the sheikh says in general for that one with that specific being meaning Iblis because he was arrogant and rebelled against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala <clears throat> As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the English translation that is in Surah Nisa, that he is called Ta'ut. Those who believe, those who believe do battle for the cause of Allah, and those who disbelieve do battle for the cause of Ta'ut. So fight the minions of the shaitan. Surely shaitan's strategy is weak. فَإِنَّ كَيْدَ الشَّيْطَانِ كَانَ ضَعِيفًا And this is verse 76 of Surah Nisa. He says, Taghut is a word that is well known to many people of the earth with exactly the same lettering according to one of the people of Ilm of the past. Al-Aqad in his book called Iblis he says <coughs> that Taghut, he is called Taghut because he transgressed, rebelled against his Lord, and tried to set himself up as an ilah, or God to be worshipped. He said, the shaitan has despaired from any mercy from Allah, and for that reason, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has named him Iblis. Has named him Iblis. The shaykh says that al-balasa, al-balas, or al-labasa, 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 al means in the Arabic language, he has no good in him. He has no good in him. And oblis, oblis means he despaired and lost. He despaired and lost. And many of the early scholars have mentioned that his name, before he rebelled, was Azazil. But the Sheikh says that Allah knows best if this is correct. Allah knows best if this is correct. <clears throat> then the Sheikh says about the Shaitan that he is makhluk, that he is created. He said, from what we find in the Quran and the Hadith, we see that the Shaitan is one of Allah's creation and he has a mind, he has the ability to understand, and he moves. And he is not like what some of the ignorant have claimed, quote-unquote, an evil spirit that takes the shape of the evil conscious animalistic part of man. And that he can take the place of the good conscious in the heart, as one person stated. We've already mentioned that shaitan is of the jinn. But the sheikh, the sheikh says that some modern and ancient writers have disputed this point. And they use a verse in Surah Al-Baqarah, Verse 30, 34, where Allah says, 
And when we said unto the angels, Prostrate yourselves before Adam, they fell prostrate all except Iblis. He demurred through pride and, and became a disbeliever. So some of them say, some of the modern energy writers, they dispute this point that the, the, the Iblis came from the jinn. There are other verses in which Allah makes an exception, makes an exception from the angels of Iblis. And they argue, these people, that if he is being accepted, meaning they all bow down except Iblis, he must have been, he must have been a part or a member of that particular group because this is the customary mode of speech. In many of the books of the Quranic commentaries and books of history, the Sheikh says we find the statements of the scholars on this point. They mentioned that the shaitan was among the, the angels and that he was the treasurer of the paradise or of the lowest heaven. He was the most honor, noble and honorable of the angels, according to some. And we have some statements that Ibn Kathir brings in his tafsir. But he says, Ibn Kathir says, that these stories have been related from many of the early scholars. Most of them are Jewish and Christian. In other words, they're Israeli Iyad uh, narrations. He said, but they need to be investigated much, much more closely. And once again, for sake of time, we won't go into it. <clears throat> then the sheikh asked the question rhetorically, was shaitan the origin of the jinn, or was he just one of them? He said, we don't possess any clear text that shaitan, or that states that shaitan was, uh, the origin of him was the jinn, or to have been the origin of all the jinn, or that states that he was simply one of them. He said, the latter is more apparent from the Quranic verse, except Iblis, and he was of the jinn. Except Iblis, and he was of the jinn. But there are other individuals who say that Wakanam in al-Jinn, that he wasn't of the jinn. They say that this Kana here means he became one of the jinn. Sara jinnan. He became one of the jinn. So this is some of the disputes that the people have. Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, has the opinion that shaitan was the origin of the jinn in the same way that Adam is the origin of all mankind. And this is in Majmura Fatawa, volume 4, pages 235 to, and also 346. As for the food of the jinn and the drink of the jinn, we have the statement of uh, El, uh, collected in the collection of Al-Bukhari on the authority of Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam told him to get some stones in order for the Prophet to clean himself from his uh, from defecating the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam told Abu Huraira the English translation that is don't Don't come, don't bring me bones or dung. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu asked the Prophet why he specifically mentioned not to bring those two items. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Huma min ta'amil jinn. They are the food of the jinn. They are the food of the jinn. And then the Prophet said, a delegation of the Nasibiyin came to me and what nice jinn they are. They asked me about their provisions. I supplicated to Allah for them that they would never pass by dung or bones except that they would find meat upon it. And recorded in the Sunnah of Al-Tirmidhi with an authentic chain, it says that the Prophet ﷺ said, Do not clean yourselves with dung or with bones for they are the food for your brothers. They are the food of your brothers from among the jinn. And in the Sahih of Muslim, it is recorded from Abdullah ibn Mas'ud <clears throat> that a messenger from the jinn came to the Prophet ﷺ and he went with them. The Prophet ﷺ read to them some Quranic verses. The Prophet showed the people the remains of their embers, their fires. 
they asked the Prophet والسلام, about their provisions and he told them every bone on which the name of Allah has been mentioned will have meat on it for you and the dung are fodder for your animals then he said do not clean yourselves with these with, 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 do not clean yourselves with these things as they are food for your brothers they are food for your brothers so this is also an indication that the jinn are believers and disbelievers because the Prophet Sallallahu wouldn't have said they are food for your brothers from among the jinn because the only ones that are our brothers are those who believe in Allah in the last day hmm. dung is the dropping the feces, the dropping from animals usually large animals like cows, camels, etc. for the little ones who are here we call this boo-boo <laughs> boo-boo for the children the prophet also informs us that the shaitans eat with their left hand and there's some discussion some differences of opinion among the scholars of Islam on if eating and drinking with the left hand is haram or not nonetheless shaitan eats with his left hand and he drinks with his left hand it is collected in the, Mus- the collection of Muslim that on the authority of Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said إِذَا أَكَلَ أَحَدُكُمْ فَلْيَأْكُلْ بِيَمِينِهِ وَإِذَا شَرِبَ فَلْيَشْرَبْ بِيَمِينِهِ فَإِنَّ الشَّيْطَانَ يَأْكُلُ بِشِمَالِهِ وَيَشْرَبُ بِشِمَالِهِ He said that if any one of you, when any one of you eats he should eat with his right hand and if he drinks he should drink with his right hand for surely shaitan eats with his left hand and drinks with his left hand and in the Musnad of Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal the Prophet ﷺ said, "Man akala bi shimalihi akala ma'ahu shaytan, wa man shariba bi shimalihi shariba ma'ahu shaytan." Whoever eats with his left hand, shaytan eats with him, and whoever drinks with his left hand, the shaytan drinks with him. So we should remember this: that the shaytan eats and drinks with his left hand. This is also a proof that shaytan eats and he drinks. Then we have a hadith from the Muslim of Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal that says if a man enters his house and mentions the name of Allah upon entering it and upon eating therein the shaitan says لا مبيت لكم ولا عشاء هاهنا there is no housing for you here and no meal for you here but if a man enters his house and neglects to mention the name of Allah upon entering it the shaitan says I have found housing for you. And if he does not mention Allah's name upon eating his meal, the shaitan says, I have found housing and a meal. This hadith was also recorded by Muslims. And these hadith are clear texts that definitely prove that the shaitan eats and drinks. And it reminds me, and don't anybody throw stones at me now from what I'm about to say, but I was reading this Sufi book. I was reading a a little book for children written by some Sufis and they had a story which of course is not authentic not of course but this particular story because every story they don't use is not unauthentic but there was a story that they, were, they had for the children that uh, I think it's appropriate here to just give you an idea they said that there were two jinns from among the shaitan the two jinns that uh, eat and drink with the, with the person when they don't say Bismillah one jinn was coming down the street and the other jinn was coming down the other side of the street and one jinn was real fat and the other jinn was real skinny so one, when the fat jinn saw this is of course not true it's not a true story not from any authentic hadith but it's you know just for our uh, Ramadan amusement the, the, the fat jinn saw the skinny jinn and said like what happened to you? and the skinny jinn says that my Qareen among the humans my partner my companion among the humans always says Bismillah before he eats and drinks so that's why he's skinny you don't, nobody got it? okay, okay. Right. then the check says in the same manner that it's prohibited for a man to eat any meat that has not had that the name of Allah has not been pronounced the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam permitted the believing jinn to eat any bone 
that has the name of Allah pronounced over it. But they're not permitted to eat meat over which Allah's name has not been mentioned. Very interesting. All that has been eaten without having the name of Allah mentioned over it provides food for the jinn who are kuffar. I repeat, all that has been eaten without having the name of Allah mentioned over it provides food for the kuffar jinn who are the shayateen. That is, for the shaitans, everything that has not had the name of Allah mentioned over it is permissible. And this is why many scholars are of the opinion that the animal that dies of itself the, the animal that is carrying and have died by themselves are food for the shaitan because the name of Allah was not mentioned over them. And Ibn Qayyim, Rahimahumullah, Rahimahullah, he deduced from the ayah of Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّمَا الْخَمْرُ وَالْمَيْسِرُ وَالْأَنصَابُ وَالْأَزْلَامُ رِجْسٌ مِّنْ عَمَلِ الشَّيْطَانِ O you who believe, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Strong drinks and games of chance and idols and divining of arrows are only the work of shaitan. Leave it aside. Leave it alone in order that you may succeed. Ibn Qayyim says that intoxicating liquors are the beverages of shaitan. And it is the drink that he orders his awliya, his patrons, to drink. And he participates with them in that action, in its drinking, in its sin, and its eventual punishment. <clears throat> uh, how much time? About oh, 35 minutes? 55 minutes, okay. Now the Shaykh discusses the uh, issue of do the jinn marry and procreate? Do the jinn marry and procreate? He says that it's apparent that the jinn do get married. He says to prove this, some of the scholars refer to the description of the spouses in paradise. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says concerning them in Surah Rahman He says the English translation there, there are, therein are those of modest gaze whom neither man nor jinn will have touched before them. So, because of this, some of the scholars say that the jinn get married and they have children. And there's also an ayah that, uh, this is verse uh, 56, though Brother Jamaluddin Zorbozo, he says it's, it's verse number 60, it's actually verse number 56, a typographical error for those who, Surah Ar-Rahman. Then uh, the Sheikh says, the author of the book called Lawami uh, Al-Anwar, he mentions a hadith which deserves a closer look to see whether it's authentic or not. He says, the hadith states that jinn have children in the same way that the children of Adam have children, but theirs are more in number. He says, this was related by Ibn Abi Hatim. He says, and uh, uh, Abu Ashaykh. He says, but on the authority of Qatada, but regardless of whether or not this hadith is authentic, he said the verse that we just mentioned in Surah Rahman is clear enough proof to say that the jinn have intercourse and they have children. And there's also another verse in Surah that I have not memorized. But there's a surah, there's a verse in Surah al kaf the cave, it also mentions Shaitan and was Zurriyatahu and his progeny, which is a proof, additional proof that shaitan or that the jinn have families. Uh, some people have the opinion that the jinn don't eat, they don't drink, and they don't have sex. But they claim, but their claim, according to Sheikh uh, al ashqar is false. Because we've seen this already in the Quran and the Sunnah. He said also that some scholars have the opinion that there are different types of jinn. Some of them do not eat, and some of them, uh, some of them do eat and drink, while others do not. One of the tabi'un, who was Wahab ibn Munabbih, radiallahu anhu, they have a quote from him which says, The jinn are of different kinds. One is a pure jinn, 
and that is like a wind that does not eat or drink, nor does it die or procreate. And there's a class of them that does eat and drink and procreate and has sex and dies. And those are those female demons and desert demons and those which are similar to those. This was recorded by Ad Tabari, Ibn Jarir Ad Tabari. But the Sheikh says, but what he said it's what what he said is itself in need of evidence and cannot be considered as a proof on its own. So he says that many scholars have discussed the nature of their eating, uh, and that it is similar to the way the human beings do. In other words, that they swallow, etc. And of course, as Sheikh Al Ashkar says, that to, to delve into this without any delil, without any proof, uh, is a mistake on our part, at least. Because if we don't have any proof from Quran and Sunnah, we should just leave it alone. As for marriage, and we hear this a lot, especially in places like Pakistan and India, and some places in Africa, we hear of uh, people saying that jinn marry human beings, and vice versa. Marry, human beings marry jinn. And there are some statements of the people of the past, but we won't go into that either. And we can come back to that if you would like, inshallah. Then the Sheikh uh, ends this particular section by rhetorically asking the question, Do jinn die? And the answer is, yes. The answer is that they will die. And there is the statement that we, statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we use pertaining to the angels. كُلَّ مَنْ عَلَيْهَا فَانْ وَيَبَقَى وَجْهُ رَبِّكَ ذُو الْجَلَالِ وَالْإِقْرَانِ It's the Surah Rahman. The 26th to the 28th verses, everything and everyone that is therein will pass away, and there remains but the face of your Lord, the face of the, your Lord of might and glory. And which is the favor of your Lord we deny. And then we have a very explicit, very explicit hadith in Al Bukhari on the authority of Ibn Abbas that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam said, أعوذ بعزتك الذي لا إله إلا أنت الذي لا يموت والجن والإنس يموتون I seek refuge by your glory, the one whom there is no deity worthy of worship except as a God, except you, the one who does not die, and the jinn and human beings will die. Explicit. Concerning the length of their lives, Sheikh Al Ashkar says we can't say much about it except of what Allah has already told us. And he said that Shaitan has been given some time, some respite, until the day of judgment. And the English translation of the verse where he says, Reprieve me till the day when they are raised from the dead, he said, Surely you are of those reprieved. فَانْظُرْنِي إِلَى يَوْمٍ يُبْعَثُونَ قَالَ إِنَّكَ مِنَ الْمُنْظَرِينَ Surah Al-A'raf, the 7th chapter of the Qur'an, verses 14 to 15. So the Shaykh says, concerning other jinn or shaitan, we don't know any specific, uh, we don't have any specific information about their lifespan, but we do know that their lifespans are no longer than that of the humans. And we also know that Khalid, Khalid ibn al-Walid, رضي الله عنه, killed a shaitan of Uzzah, shaitan of Uzzah, which was a tree that the Arabs used to worship. He killed a shaitan from this particular thing. And also that a companion killed a jinn that took the form of a wa'as, or a uh, serpent. Then the sheikh mentions the residency of the, the residence of the jinn in the places and times that they can be found. He said the jinn live upon the same earth that the human beings live upon. He said most of them can be found among the ruins and dilapidated areas, as well as the places where there are many impure things, such as bathrooms, such as hashish dens, uh, places of camels. I guess we can throw crack houses in there, right? Crack houses and liquor stores. Uh, the places where the camels uh, dwell, and also cemeteries. 
For that reason, Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah says, those people who are close to the shaitan usually inhabit such places. He said, there are hadith that say that one should not pray in bathrooms due to the impurities present. And because, of course, it's the abode of shaitan. Nor should we pray in cemeteries because it leads to shirk, polytheism, and it is also a home for the shaitan. And many of them are in the places which may be sources of evil, such as the aswah, the marketplaces. The Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, said, <clears throat> he said, and this is something that the sisters should pay close attention to, specifically, not to separate them, but specifically, and especially in places that we find in the Middle East, we find the women frequenting the marketplaces. The Prophet ﷺ said, If you can, if you're able, do not be the first one to enter into the marketplace. And don't be the last one to exit the marketplace. For they are the places of the shaitans, and they are the places in where shaitan raises his flag. He raises his flag. And of course we know, we, we can definitely... Uh, it's, uh, an inference that shaitan's flag doesn't say la ilaha illallah we don't know what it says but for sure I, I'm very sure that shaitan's flag when he raises it doesn't say la ilaha illallah on it so the sheikh says shaitans live in the same houses that the people live in one can stop them one can stop them from entering or staying in the houses by simply Mentioning the name of Allah when the person enters the house. Or by remembering or mentioning Allah with zikr. Or reciting the Quran. Like Surah Al-Baqarah and other portions of the Quran. Or reciting Ayat Al-Kursi. The verse that is called the verse of the throne. But I think it would be better for us to call it the verse of the footstool. Ayat Al-Kursi. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has stated that the shaitan spread out and roam about increasingly when dark come. And therefore, he has advised the Muslims to bring in their children after sunset. Maybe this, maybe this is the reason why the brothers tell their wives, don't go out after Maghrib, or come back home by Maghrib. Think this is the reason, brothers? This is the reason? It's not because we're chauvinists, right? It's because the shaitan comes out at night, right? Okay. Alhamdulillah. This is stated in the hadith that was recorded by al-Bukhari and Muslim. Uh, the fact that the children are told to come in at night, the Prophet said that. And he said also that the shaitan runs away from the call of prayer. When you say, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, the Deiran, then the shaitan runs away. And he can't stand listening to it. Incidentally, I want to make a special note here. Unfortunately, some of us have a, um, a habit, probably, obviously unbeknowing to us of not reciting the letters in the Azan properly. Just wanted to take this time to mention this quickly. Some of us are saying Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar. You hear? Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar by putting a fatha on the word Akbar. On the last letter, the the, the R or the Ra of Akbar. Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar and this is incorrect. This is incorrect because it didn't, it did, the hadith didn't come like this to us. And it also changes the meaning. The actual wording is Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, not Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. In addition to this, we should be very careful in not making statements of kufr. Some of us have a habit of saying Allahu Akbar by putting a medda on Allahu Akbar. We're now saying, is Allah, we're asking the question, is Allah the greatest? And this is a statement of kufr. And also there are some people who when they call the event, they say, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. They hold Akbar. And the word Akbar with an Aleph is the plural word for a tabal, which is a drum. So now the person is saying, Allah is a set of drums. Well, they have been left. This is a statement of kufr. So we should be very careful. 
And I'm not sure if shaitan runs away from this type of event. Allah knows best. Also, the shaitan is chained up, locked up, in the month of Shaban, right? Oh, Ramadan. Alhamdulillah. So everybody's not sleeping. The place where the shaitan sit and gather, according to the Prophet, alayhi salatu This is collected in some books of the Sunan. That the shaitans love to sit between the shade and the sunlight. For this reason, the Prophet wasallam forbade the Muslims to sit in these places. They like to sit between the shade and the sunlight. It seems also that the shaitans, the jinns, have some connection with animals. In the hadith of uh, Ibn Mas'ud, recorded in Muslim, the jinn asked the Prophet wasallam about their provisions. He told them, Every bone on which the name of Allah is recited is your provision. The time it will fall in your hand, it will be covered with flesh. And the dung of the camels is fodder for your animals. So, because of this, the Prophet wasallam has informed us that they possess animals. And that the father for the animals is the dung of the animals of mankind. So the jinn have animals. There are some specific animals that the shaitans accompany. The shaitans accompany some animals like camels. The Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam said, لا تصلوا في مبارك الإذل فإنها من الشياطين وصلوا في مرابط الغنم فإنها باركة Verily, he said, do not pray in the pastures of the camels, for they are from the shaitan. But pray in the fields of the sheep, for they are blessings. And the Prophet also said, لا تصلوا في مبارك الإبل إن الإبل خلقت من الشياطين وإن وراء كل ذعير الشيطان Verily, the camels have been created from shaitan. Surely, the camels have been created from shayateen. And behind every camel, there's a shaitan. Behind every camel, there's a shaitan. The meaning of this, I don't know. I know that we can eat camel meat, but it's very interesting, brothers and sisters, that after you eat camel meat, you have to make wudu. After you eat the meat of the camel, you have to make wudu. Your wudu is broken. So I don't know if there's any relationship or correlation, any uh, relation to this, of them being created from the jinn. Uh, and the word that the Prophet used was ibl. And so, um, this is a certain type of camel or what, but this is the standard word, I believe, for camel. And so we take it the way it is, and Allah knows best. Also, the Prophet Wasallam said, Don't pray near the water holes of the camels, for they have been created from the shayateen. وَلَا تُصَلُّوا فِي أَعْطَانِ الْإِذُلْ فَإِنَّهَا خُلِقَتْ مِنَ الشَّيَاطِينَ This hadith is recorded with an authentic chain by Ibn Majah. So these hadith uh, refute the claims of those who state that the reason it is forbidden to pray in the places of the camels is that their urine and their dung are impure. Because actually the urine and the dung of an animal that is permissible to eat is not considered impure as we know. We also know that shaitan is extremely ugly. Extremely. The shaitan has a very ugly appearance. This is something that is well accepted by the rational man the rational man Allah compares the branches of the tree called the Qum in the hell to the heads of the shaitan Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says إِنَّهَا شَجْرَةٌ تَخُجُ فِي أَصْلِ الْجَحِيمِ تَلْعُهَا كَأَنَّهُ رُؤُوسُ الشَّيَاطِينَ the English translation is is it better as a welcome or the tree of the... Surely it is a tree that springs in the heart of hell. Its crops 
is as it were the heads of the shaitans. So, this, from this we know, number one, uh, that the shaitan has a head. And if the hadith is authentic, if the hadith is authentic, we know the shaitan also has hair because there's a hadith, if it is authentic, that the Prophet wasallam saw a man whose hair was disheveled in some manner that was disheveled and he says, why doesn't this man do something with his hair having his hair like the hair of shaitan? If the hadith is authentic, that will give us the, the evidence that shaitan has hair. <coughs> uh, so, but the rational mind, the shaykh says, lets us know that the, that the jinn, the shayateen, the evil ones, the shaitan, looks ugly because we know that the angels are extremely beautiful. As we mentioned this morning, the angels are extremely beautiful, so it would just be a logical conclusion that the shayateen are ugly. The shaitan is ugly. But uh, according to Sheikh al-Ashkar, not but, but in addition to this, the Christians, he says, of the Middle Ages used to picture shaitan as a black man with a pointed beard, raised eyebrows, with a mouth that emits flames, horns, and hoofs, and so on. And of course, uh, we don't want to get into anything on this, but uh, we'll leave this the way it is. Because of course there's some people who say, it's the devil is white, right? <laughs> <laughs> we also know that shaitan, shaitan has two horns. In the Sahih of Muslim, it is recorded from Ibn Umar, عنهما, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لا تحروا بصلاتكم طلوع الشمس ولا غروبها فإنها تطلع بين قرني الشيطان Do not pray when the sun is rising or when it is setting Surely it rises and sets between the horns of shaitan And again he said, this is, that was in Muslim and then in Bukhari and Muslim If the sun is setting, then leave the prayer until it disappears And do not wait for your prayer until the sun is rising For while it is, for while it is setting, nor while it is setting for surely it sets and rises between the horns of shaitan. <coughs> As for the ability and the strength of the shaitan, we have the story in the surah called an naml the bee, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informs us of an ifrit. An ifrit is what? What did Ibn Abdul Bar say? Ifrit is what kind of jinn? Big shot. The big shot jinn? The big bad one? The one is the stronger one. We have the story in the Quran, in Surah Nemo, the B, verse 39 and 40. The English translation says, A stalwart, or a tefrit, from among the jinn said, I will bring it to you before you can rise from your place. Surely I am very strong and trusty for such work. One with, him who, one with whom was knowledge of the scripture said, I will bring it to you before your gaze returns to you. And when he saw it, he saw it set in his presence, and he said, This is from the bounties of my Lord. This is from the bounties of my Lord. Have them in Fadli Rabbi. Incidentally, does anyone know the name of the man who bought the throne, according to some scholars of Islam? Anyone here knows? The throne, the throne in the story about the peace, when uh, about the Ifrit said, "I'll bring it to you. you uh, I will bring it to you. I'm, a I'm able to do it, and I will bring it to you." Uh, what do we say? Before, no, excuse me. I am trusty and strong, and I will, I will do the work for you and bring it to you before you can rise from your place. And then one who had knowledge of the scripture said, "I will bring it to you before you can bat your eye." In other words, does anyone know this man's name? According to some of the uh, scholars of Tafsir, you know? I don't know. That's why I'm asking. No one knows? Okay. I think you mentioned it one time before, but I can't remember. Okay. As for the human events that the jinn have knowledge of, 
The jinn used to go to the lower heavens to eavesdrop on the inhabitants of the heavens in order to find out what future events would happen. When the Prophet ﷺ was sent with his message, meaning the Qur'an, a number of the quote-unquote guards in the heavens were increased. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says in the Qur'an, وَأَنَّا لَمَسْنَا السَّمَاءَ فَوَجَدْنَاهَا مُلِئَتْ حَرُثًا شَدِيدًا وَشُبْهًا وَأَنَّا كُنَّا نَقْعُدُ, نقعد مِنْهَا مَقَاعِدًا لِلْسَّمْعِ فَمَنْ, فمن يَسْتَمِعِ الْآنَ يَجِدُ لَهُ شَهَابًا رَصَدًا In Surah Al-Jinn it says that the jinn eavesdrop on the angels uh, to gain future events on the human beings. They used to take this information down to their mediums their soothsayers, their astrologers, the crystal ball gazers, the palm readers, and give them information of the uh, events that are going to happen in the future to the human being, and then uh, thereby making the people think that uh, these people, these mediums on earth, uh, have some information. But in actuality, the jinns were the ones who were stealing this information. And Allah, of course, sent shooting stars to thwart them, and also place angels there to keep them from eavesdropping. We also know that the jinn used to, uh, by the power and permission of Allah, used to assist the Prophet Sulaiman. The English translation of the verse, Surah Sabah, verse 12 and 13, says, And we gave him certain of the jinn who worked before him by the permission of his Lord, and some of them has deviated from our command, then we caused them to then we caused to taste the punishment of flaming fire. They made for him this is the highlighted point. They made for him what he willed, synagogues and statues, basins like wells and boilers built into the ground. Give thanks, O house of Dawood. Few of my bondsmen, few of my slaves are thankful. So we know from this that the jinn have had these abilities to build. And they used to do this for the Prophet Sulaiman. They also have the ability to resemble human beings. They also have the, re- the ability to resemble human beings and takes the shape of human beings and animals. On the day of Badr, Shaitan approached the polytheist in the form of a man and promised, and he promised the, the, the kuffar to aid them on that day. Concerning this particular event, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in Surah Anfal, verse 48, the English translation, And when Shaitan made their deeds seem fair to them, and said, No one of mankind can conquer you this day, for I am your protector. But when the armies came out in sight of one another, he took flight, saying, Surely I am innocent of you. Surely I see that which you do not. Surely I am innocent of you. Truly I fear Allah, and Allah is severe in punishment. And this was the shaitan that came to the mushrikun in the form of a man named Suraqa ibn Malik. Suraqa ibn Malik. And of course we all know the story, I'm sure, of Ibn Utaymi, excuse me, of uh, Abu Huraira, radiallahu anhu, who in the month of Ramadan was guarding the Zakat al and the man came to him and said that he had problems and he needed, he needed food for his family. His family was hungry. And he grabbed him and said, I was going to take you to the Messenger of Allah. And this happened two or three times. And then finally, he said, I will teach you something if you let me go. And the Prophet uh, kept asking him, what about your visitor last night? Uh, that he will definitely come again. And then he caught him again. And the uh, visitor said, I, if you let me go, I'll teach you some words by which Allah will greatly benefit you. When you go to bed, recite Ayat al-Kursi. The verse called Ayat al-Kursi. And he says, if you do so, a guardian from Allah will come and protect you from the devils until the morning. So Abu Huraira said, I decided to let him go. In the morning, the Messenger of Allah came again and said, what happened to your prisoner last night, O Abu Huraira? I answered, he claimed that he would teach me some words that which would benefit me greatly. The Prophet, ﷺ, said, he has told you the truth, although... He is a liar. Do you know who that person was you were talking to last, the last three nights? He replied, no, I do not. He said, that was shaitan. That was shaitan. So this hadith is clear 
that shaitan can come in the form of a human being. He also can come in the form of some animals, like camels, donkeys, cows, dogs, or cats. And he also can come in the form of a black dog. As the Prophet ﷺ said, the black dog interrupts the prayer because it is shaitan. And Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, says in his opinion, the black dog is the state, the Satan of the dog, and the jinn often takes its form. And it's very interesting that uh, David Berkowitz, the son of Sam, who's in Sing Sing prison right now, unless they moved him. Uh, the last time I remember, he was in Sing Sing. The son of Sam, David Berkowitz, anyone know who Sam was? Was the black dog that he said used to whisper to him to take that 44 caliber gun and shoot people. There's also some indication that uh, they take the forms of black cats. And uh, Ibn Taymiyyah says, if this is his quote, that they take the form of black cats or the color black because they have the greatest strength for uh, retaining the heat. This retaining the heat with this color black. Also, the jinn take the forms of snakes and they appear in front of the human being. It is for this reason that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has forbade us, he has made it forbidden, the killing of the jinns that you find in your houses. Please listen closely in case a jinn takes the form of a snake and comes in your house. This is what the Prophet has instructed us to do. And as one great scholar of Islam said, I believe it was Imam Malik, if this narration is authentic from Imam Malik, if it is authentic, he said that the Sunnah is like Noah's Ark. Whoever rides it is saved and whoever abandons it drowns. So if you want to know how to get the, get the, give it to the jinn, I think you should listen to this next statement of the Messenger of Allah. And uh, Brother Imran has some statements to make about that statement as attributed to Imam Malik. And we'll let him stay happy with inshallah. A group of jinn in Medina had embraced Islam, according to hadith on the, on the story of Abu Sa'id and al-Khudri, radiallahu anhu, that the Prophet said a group of jinn in Medina had embraced Islam. So he who sees any of them should warn it three times. And if it appears after that, it should be killed, for it must be a shaitan. One of the companions of the Prophet killed one of the snakes in the house, and this led to his death. Muslim has recorded in his Sahih <clears throat> that one of the companions went to Abu Sa'id uh, to his house. It was Abu Sa'ib went to Abu Sa'id's house and found him praying. Abu Sa'ib was waiting for him to finish his prayer. When he heard some rumbling in the bushes of wood, which were lying in the corner of the house, he looked and he found that it was a snake. He was about to kill it when Abu Sa'id gestured to him to sit down. After the salah, Abu Sa'id pointed to a room and he said, Do you see this room? He said, Yes. Yeah. This is the reply of Abu Sa'id. Abu Sa'id said, There was once a man who was a newlywed, and we went to participate with the Prophet in the Battle of the Trench. The trench. He used to ask the Prophet's permission to go to his wife, and the Prophet cautioned him to take along his weapons, for he feared an attack from behind, from, from behind by the tribe of Koreba. The man took his weapons, and when he returned to his family, he found his wife standing between the doors of the apartment. He was enraged from jealousy and took a stab at her with his spear. She told him to keep his spear away and to enter the house to see what had made her go outside. He entered and found a big snake on the bed. He struck it with his spear and pierced it. He was bent upon taking it outside, but the snake had enough strength to bite him. No one knows who died first from that incident, the snake or the man. The prophet made mention of this incident, excuse me, the people made mention of this incident to the Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu wasalam, asking him to ask Allah to bring that man back to life. Instead, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam said, 
Ask for forgiveness for our companions. Ask for forgiveness for our companions. Astaghfiru li sahibikum. In Medina, there are jinn that embrace Islam. If any of you should see one of them, that is a snake, he should give him warning for three days. If it appears after that, it should be killed. Because surely, innama huwa shaitan. Because it is a shaitan. So the Sheikh uh, then mentions some regulations, he said, regarding the prohibition of killing such animals with respect to the snakes. He said, number one, the regulation concerning the prohibition of killing such animals is with respect to snakes only and not with respect to all animals. Number two, the regulation does not extend to every snake but only to those that are found in the house. Those that are found outside of the houses may be killed. Number three, if one sees a snake in the house, then he should warn it. That is, order it to leave by saying something similar to, I adjure you by Allah to leave this house and take your evil from us. If you do not do so, we shall kill you. If you see it after three days, then you should kill it. Fourthly, the reason that it is to be killed only after three days is a precautionary step in order to ensure that that snake that you're killing is not a jinn among, from among the Muslims that has become a snake. And if it was such a jinn, he would leave the house if you ordered it to leave the house. If he does not leave it, then he deserves to be killed as it is. And in that case, a rebellious, non-believing jinn that deserves to be killed due to the harm that it brings to the inhabitants of the house. And number five, there is one type of snake that is found in the house which, we, uh, which we've been given special permission to kill out of the snakes among the many snakes. And the Sahih of al-Bukhari, we have a hadith of Abu Lubaba that the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, do not kill the jinn except everyone with two streaks on the back for they cause miscarriages and take away the eyesight. Therefore, kill them. To the snakes that have two streaks down their back, they are the snakes that causes miscarriages in women, and they are the snakes that takes away eyesight. And also we know from the Prophet's statements and hadith that is collected by Sabarani that the snakes are the transmutations of the shape of the jinns in the same way that the apes and swines are transmutations of the tribes of Israel, or the Jews from among the tribes of Israel. Also we know that the shaitan flows in the human being like the flowing of blood. And though there are some scholars among the salaf who say that this doesn't mean exactly this, we'll take the hadith the way it is, and Allah knows best. Also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, In the case that shaitan kana da'ifa, that shaitan's plot is weak. Meaning the shaitans have no power over those who believe. And there are various verses of the Quran that mention this. And we're going to end now here, inshallah, uh, on the subject of shaitan not having power over us. But there's one ayah that we'd like to mention that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in Surah Ibrahim in the English translation of that is Surely I promised you a promise of truth and I promised you then failed you. And I had that Allah said that shaitan says and I have no power over you except that I called you and you obeyed. You obeyed me. I cannot help you nor can I help myself. And in Surah Nahl, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّمَا سُلْطَانُهُ عَلَى الَّذِينَ يَتَوَلَّوْنَهُ وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ بِهِ مُشْرِكُونَ That his power is only over those who make him a friend and those who commit shirk, who are mushrikun, who swear partners to him. 
Those are the ones who shaitan has power over. And Allah gives power over shaitan to those who believe. And surely, once again, shaitan's plot is weak. Subhanaka wa hamdika, ashadu an la ilaha illa anta, astaghfiruk wa atubu ilayk. If there are any uh, questions and statements or comments about this, inshallah, we'll have them now. Rebuttals, corrections, whatever. Questions also, inshallah. I have a question. Yes. You know this book, right? Yes. The book that he's holding up, sisters, is the book called The Jinn, the essay of Ibn Taymiyyah, translated by Bilal Phillips. Okay. Explain to the guy, can you explain this? What means? Uh, the dominion and the praise, uh, 100 times per day, will have a reward similar of being 10 slaves, 100 good deeds will be recorded for him, and 100 of his sins raised. And he will have a charm against sitting for a whole day uh, until the night. None can do better than that except one who does it more times. <coughs> and he will have a charm against Satan. What does that mean? Charm. I don't know what it says in Arabic. I don't know. You know this word, anyone? Anyone? I don't know what this means. No, he doesn't. Have, he, he brings the, the, the uh, hadith in Arabic in this book. In the beginning of the book, or I mean the end of the book. Inshallah, we can come to. We ask Sheikh Abdullah when he wakes up. Inshallah, maybe. And next, yes. You speak up, please. Speak up, please. What is their punishment? According to Abdullah ibn Abbas. The angel, the jinn are, of course, created, we know they're created from fire, but they're no longer in the, of that essence. According to Abdul Ibn Abbas, they are now a reh, they're now a wind. And they will be, it's implied that they will be punished with the opposite of what, is in, uh, of what they, they were created from, which is extreme cold. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, لا يرون فيها شمسا وزمزهيرا well, zem, zem, zem hahira, zem hahira. That in the in the uh, in the paradise there will be no uh, you'll find no heat nor bitter cold. So this we can deduce that they will be beat by extreme by bitter cold. <clears throat> yes. Because of course also, Aki, we are created from mud. But we're no longer mud. We're created from clay, but we're no longer clay. <laughs> yes, we're going to be punished. Yes, we're going to be punished with fire. No, it won't. It will not be. No, it will not be. No, I'm saying they will. It will not be. It's not an indication that they won't be punished by fire. Uh, excuse me. By the way, uh, uh, as far as the jinn entering into the fire. The uh, uh, one of the sheikhs uh, whose name I forget, I think his name is Abdul Salam. He has a four tape series on the jinn. Uh, he said he asked the rhetorical question: How will the how will the jinn be punished when they're created from fire? He said there are three possible answers to this. He said the first is that the jinn is created from fire, but n- they're not fire now, as we just mentioned. He said, because he said, just as we're created from 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 teen, but we're now flesh. All right. He says, and of course, uh, some of the sellers say that the 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 material of the jinn now is a rutuba. Rutuba again is a so moist, moist, wet material. Moist, moist, wet material. The, it's a wind that's moist. And in the uh, Sahih of al-Bukhari in Austin Muslim, and also in the Sa'i with an authentic chain, uh, there is a statement that says that the Prophet ﷺ 
when he caught the jinn who was trying to disturb him in his salah, that the jinn, Yerhamakullah, he caught the jinn and his, the mouth of the jinn was on the Prophet's hand and he said that, the Prophet والسلام, said that there was coldness on his hand. Coldness on his hand. So this lets some of the scholars know that, uh, that the material that they're made from now is like this. He says the second uh, answer that could be for this is the answer that we gave before that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says لا يرون, لا يرون فيها شمسا ولا زمهريرا زمهريرا yes that you will not find any heat nor uh, extreme heat nor bitter cold and this is a proof that they are using what is understood from this ayah is that the fire is extreme heat and bitter cold uh, so so the maqum the, the implicit nature of the ayah is that the jinn will be punished by Zim Hahira. And also the third possible uh, the third possible answer to this is is that our Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the blessed exalted Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, is able to do whatever he wants to do and he created the human being from a material that he will be, that he will be punished by and that the jinn will be also punished by the same material that they were created from. Because Allah has power over everything. Yes. The food that which Allah may have never mentioned over are the food for the saints, for the non-believing saints. Right. From among the jinn. Now, you may not know the people of the book school, what are their food for men, what the name of Allah has mentioned over their food. No, this is, we're not talking about at the time of slaughtering. He said the name, the, any food that the name of Allah has not been mentioned over, meaning at eat, when you eat. Not necessarily, and not excluding the fact of slaughtering, but the hadith doesn't mention slaughtering. The hadith just mentions any food that the name of Allah has not been mentioned over. Yes. Let's hold up just a minute for this. No, go ahead, and then we'll get the system. No, go ahead. Um, when you mentioned that the camel, you, did you state that the camel was created? That's what the Prophet said. Yeah. It says, خُلِقَتِ الْإِذُمْ مِنَ الشَّيَاطِينَ مِنَ الشَّيَاطِينَ From the shaitan. And another narration that Ibn Taymiyyah brings in the Majmura Fatawa, he brings a narration, he says, خُلِقَتِ الْإِذُمْ مِنَ الْجَانِ From the jinn. They created from the jinn. I mean, yeah, there was a... Yes. So, is from or by? Hmm? Is from or by? From. Some people can change that they are going to say that they were coming to the... So, he said that jinn, a human being, can have children or have sex with them. Do you know anything? Any truth? We mentioned this. I left jinn. Go to the video, I mean, go to the tape. Inshallah. Oh. No, Muhammad. Oh, the same question. Well, if you don't recite like the surah or the karma of Mufi, the jinn eat with you, right? Not the kalima, just Bismillah. Yes, they partake. I've heard this before. We can ask Sheikh Abdullah about this. I don't know. There's some people who say, for those sisters who may not be listening, there's some people who say that if you don't say Bismillah, then the shay- shaytan, the jinn, has, uh, has intercourse with the person while they're with their wife. Um, uh, depending on announcement, for anybody who wants to do wudu, let them go and they can start going and making wudu, uh, so we don't congest. I, I think they hear your announcement. <laughs> I have a question. Uh, we do know, I don't know if any authentic hadith about this, but we do know that the Prophet wasallam told us to say, Allahumma jinnim in the shaytan, wa jinnim in the shaytan, ma'u razaqtana. If you make this dua before a man has this relationship with his wife, shaitan won't be able to touch their children. They won't be, they won't, they won't be affected by the touch of shaitan. As for the shaitan or the jinn participating, I don't know anything about this. And just because I don't know about it, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist or it's not true. Yes, Muhammad. Uh, there's a long tradition among the uh, Orientalists. Uh, and it culminated in Solomon Rushdie's satanic verses, where the claim was that Muhammad was uh, given revelation 
in quotes by Shaitan and that he didn't know it was Shaitan and it got in the Quran and then he took it out and there's a whole debate on this. So, would, do you have anything to say about that? The only thing I have to say about it is, of course, the point I'm making is that this was behind the fatwa, but there are writings by Orientals, including Montgomery Watt, where they question Muhammad Sallallahu prophethood by this claim of event, which they say there are Arab historians who document it. Well, uh, for those sisters that didn't hear what he said, uh, he's saying that Montgomery Watt and some other Orientalists uh, state that the Prophet Wasallam actually received some quote-unquote revelation from Shaitan, and some of those things are in the Quran. What I would say to them and anyone else, قُلْ هَاتُوا بُرْحَانَكُمْ إِن كُنْتُمْ Allah says, say, bring your proof if you're truthful. Yes, Akhi. When you said uh, the jinns had stolen, they can't hear. Uh, I remember that you said the jinns had stolen information and given the information to the palm readers and the crystal ballers. Uh, I come across that uh, actually, if you can clarify this with me, that the jinns has their own uh, form of religion or faith. And there's another part to that. After that, is that true? Another part was uh, I'm not sure. I don't remember the speaker, but he had said that Shaitan knows the powers of Allah, and Shaitan uh, worships Allah more than humans do, because he knows that Allah has the power, he's the power of all, but he has a deal that he was to uh, astray, make a whole, whole lot of humans astray from the path of Allah at the, at the day of resurrection. From yeah, the first part, uh, you mentioned, you, you, what was the first thing you said? The first one was about the, the, the jinns have their own faith. Yeah, to the, to the best of my knowledge, there's some narrations of uh, uh, Amash, one of, the, one of our people of the past, of our rightly guided predecessors, that mentions uh, him talking, um, uh, sitting with a jinn, and he saw, uh, it says the luqma, he saw a, a morsel of food going up and down, but he didn't see anybody putting it in their mouth. And, uh, uh, he asked him, you know, what's your favorite food? What's the food among you? And he, the, the, the jinn said rice. And that, um, do you have any of these people among you? And he meant the Rafidah, the Shia. Uh, if this is true, if this narration is true, uh, it's not from the Prophet, it's not from the Sahaba, and this is like the end of the Tabi'in, you know, the end of the, middle to the end of the Tabi'in. If it's true, then we can safely say, that yesterday they do have religions that are similar to the Kuffar among the, among the human beings. But even if we don't rely on that story, if it's reliable or not, even if we don't even look at it, uh, they have the ability to choose right from wrong. So, of course, they can have, you know, I'm sure that they have jinn who are Christians and Jews and Hindus and Buddhists or whatever. And the other part... Yeah, but he worships Allah in a manner that Allah has him to worship him. Doesn't mean he's more powerful or more knowledgeable than the human being about Allah. Oh, hmm? What do you mean by He worships Allah, he makes salah. Of course. The time that you're told not to make salah is the time that he makes it. From hadith. When the shaitan makes salah? The rising of the sun. And he makes it without wudu. And he says, I met uh, this, uh, you know, uh, jinn. And jinn says, I, I am a guest for you before. But you are more than pious and I, I want to become Islam now. So I meet him, his brother, he meet him, you know, Jin. And he, you know, Jin became his love. And just... Uh, uh, it could be. It could be. And the brother says, same thing, you know, Jin, jin group. They are also helpful, you know, to Russian. It could be. Allah knows, it could be. Yes. Wasn't there um, um, a generation where the Prophet was 
reciting the Quran and uh, Shaitan made him uh, deviate on one of the things and then it was sort of made known uh, of this deviation in his recitation. Do you know that? No. No. And once again, just because I don't know of it, it doesn't mean that it's not true or that it doesn't exist. Yes. Santa Maria stuff. Santeria, not Santa Maria. <laughs> Santeria. <laughs> you mean the. Unfortunately, my relatives are somewhat into it. I want to know how do you protect yourself from these people? I mean, if they decide to, because I'm not feeling so How do you protect yourself from those people that are involved in gin and things like that? You put your. you, you believe correctly. And you put your trust in Allah. Hmm? Yeah. Because I, 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 some of the stories I've heard from them, they have these shadows, you know? Going down the house. Like, I was there one time, you know, at night time, and you hear all these noises, and no one left the house. Yeah, yeah just... You, as, as, if we, if we, as that, as that verse Surah Nahal, in the, in the Surah called the B, the, uh, if we put our trust in Allah, we believe in Allah and put our trust in Allah, then shaitan has no power over us. He only has the power over the ones that the one who, who put their trust in him, or whom mushrikun. But is the angels present in that house, per se, due to, you know, all the statues that are there, and the angels are present? And the hadith is clear. That they don't enter a place where there's when you go into the bathroom, that's only for going into the bathroom. And I wouldn't sit here and say that uh, we could take that dua that's used for the bathroom and use it to go into the house and the same effect will happen. I'm not going to sit here and say that. Yeah. We have a uh, hadith. We have we have the hadith where the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Excuse me. We have the hadith from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam where he said that "Ajib al abwab wa zikr al Allah alayha, fa inna shaytan la yiftahu baban ujib alayhi." And the translation is: Close the doors and mention Allah's name, for the shaytan cannot open a door that has been closed upon them. And then another hadith says, فَإِنَّ الشَّيْطَانَ لَا يَفْتُحُ بَابًا مُغْلَقًا وَأَوْكُوا قَرْبَكُمْ وَذْكُرُ اسْمَ اللَّهِ وَخَمِّرُوا آلِيَتَكُمْ وَذْكُرُ اسْمَ اللَّهِ وَلَوْ أَنَّ تَعَرَّضُوا عَلَيْهَا وَتُعَرِضُوا عَلَيْهَا شَيْئًا وَأَطْفِئُوا مَصَابِيحَكُمْ The hadith says, uh, close your doors and cover your vessels and tie up your water skins and put out your lamps for shaitan does not open a closed door, nor does he take off a cover, nor does he untie the water skin. And I think I read the other one. <laughs> the devils do not open a shut door, tie your buckets, and mention Allah's name upon them, even if it's just putting something over them, and extinguish your lamps. So it's pretty clear. Just, you know, mention the name of Allah when you go in the house. Lock the door. Khalaf. Yes. I don't know. Could be. It could be. I don't know all the hadith. I don't even know half of the hadith in the world. I don't even know. But it could be. Yeah, just do what the Prophet says. Say Bismillah. As far as giving the angels salams, I don't know about this. I know that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to make this dua that's collected by a Tirmidhi. When you go in, he says, after you say it, he says, then, summa yisallam ala ahli. Then he gives salam to his family. But I don't know of a hadith that says he gives salam to the angels. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's people over here that haven't been. Yeah. Uh, Allah knows best. But I know that a person can be locked up and still have movement. 
Right? There are people in jail, but they walk around in the jail, they're locked up, right? And Allah knows best. You can have a straight jacket on, you can have handcuffs on, you can still move. Right? Allah knows best. <laughs> okay. That's it. The sisters have sent the... Uh, yes. Yes, sir. You wanted to say something? Oh, you wanted to say something? Okay, we we'll leave this last one for him. Yes. You want to ask? Hmm? <laughs> okay. The sisters have some questions, but they're going to, inshallah, they're going to ask this. Of, uh, this is of something different. It's not this subject. Inshallah. Subhanallah. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah.